Okay. Man, it has been a long time. Thank you for joining me on The King's Monologue. And honestly, I'm feeling like a little bit of a stranger because I can't remember the last time I've literally just created a video like this where I'm talking to my community and taking you through a reconstruction. I know we've done a lot of live streams. Well, not recently, recent, but you know, most recently we've done quite a few live streams and I've done a few documentaries, but I can't remember the last time I've just taken you through a reconstruction, but I had to on this occasion because I'm quite excited about this. Be sure to stay tuned for the bonus feature at the end of this video. Actually, it's twofold. One, I can't do live streams with you at the moment because my internet connection is very sporadic at the moment. I have no control over how it's performing. And secondly, because <laughs> this one really is exciting. And I kind of want to take you through the process because it's been a little while. I did say I wanted to change the format of these reconstructions, see if I could make them a little bit more dynamic. So I don't know, let's see how this goes. Let's just see how it goes. You've probably seen from the video title that the Nazut that I am going to be reconstructing in this video is Kakaure Senusret the Third. Okay, that's a mouthful. And I'm actually really excited about this because this is, first of all, I've done a couple of Old Kingdom. I've done quite a few in the New Kingdom. And the Middle Kingdom I've wanted to touch for so long now. But this is the first time I'm actually getting into the Middle Kingdom, um, 12th Dynasty. So I'm excited about that. So I'm excited about that. I'm also excited about the fact that is Senusret III because he is such a significant ruler in Kemetic history. He's widely touted and renowned for his conflicts. I'm going to say that in inverted commas, but he's also conversely known for increasing diplomatic exchanges with Nubia and increasing the trade that took place between Kemet and Nubia. Now, I say Kemet and Nubia and Nubia, if you've been on this channel, should know this already is a bit of a misnomer because the term Nubia didn't actually exist in the time of Sen Rusret III or in fact, any dynastic pharaoh. The term Nubia is a new term. Um, which means land of gold or something along those lines, but it's a very new term. The land south of Kemet had different names and this is where it gets a little bit complicated because when Sin Rosret III talks about his expansions to the south, he doesn't always use the same term. For instance, on the Estella of Kusobek, he talks about his expansions and his war against the Asiatics. And then he speaks about his war against the Nubians, but obviously the word Nubia doesn't exist. And he actually speaks about his war against the people of the bow or the people of the land of the bow, which is Tarseti. Now, where this gets confusing is Tarseti is actually the first known of Upper Kemet. It's a part of ancient Egypt, but because it's sat right on the border of what we know today to be ancient Egypt. The term Tar City was sometimes used to describe the people in the south. And this is where it gets quite confusing because this is almost like, imagine England and, you know, I live in London. Now imagine that London is also the name that we use to describe the French. Because that's what we have here. We have, you know, a major city maybe the major city or the biggest, largest city to the south of a kingdom, because of its location, is also used as a descriptor for the French. Now, if you're like me, that sounds rather bizarre, doesn't it? You, don't, you haven't really seen this um, trend repeated in history. So why would they describe the people to the south the same as the people in the southernmost portion of their actual territory. Who decided that the Tarsetians that were for all intents and purposes a part of ancient Kemet were now going to be classified under a different nationality and under this different Nubian banner? Who made this decision? And that's where I think there's a lot of fuzzy logic that takes place when it comes to Egyptology. 
And if you've watched my other video, We Was Kangs, okay, I do break down, not extensively, but enough so that you understand the supremacist, ideological, and largely biased viewpoints that were taken on by the early Egyptologies and taken for granted by the Egyptologists that therefore followed them. And what we see in front of us today is a result of years and years and years of building from a faulty foundation. And I think in the regions south of Kemet, there's so much confusion in terms of the way they're treated historically. The period of his rule was one of the most flourishing periods for um, Kemeto-Nubian relations. By the way, I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that Pharaoh Senghor Suet III did not have his fair share of very open xenophobia towards surrounding nations. He had the, that viewpoint towards Libyans, towards Asiatics and towards people south who are called Nubians, but I don't really know what to call them. Um, he called them all wretched at different moments in time. So you can see there was an air of superiority that was held by the Kemetic people in relation to the nations that surrounded them. One of the reasons that Sinistra III is actually so famous today is because there's actually so many depictions of him. He was pharaoh during a time when artwork was really flourishing in ancient Kemet. And as a result, he commissioned many, many, many artworks of himself. So we actually get to see him at various stages in life. And for me, as a reconstruction artist, this makes my life really interesting and actually really enjoyable. It makes for very enjoyable work because I've got so many different reference materials to look at. And actually, you really start to get familiar when you see the same face over and over again. And you actually start to be able to place different pieces of artwork at different stages in his life. Now, the one thing that near enough all of Sinister the Third's artworks have in common is the fact that they all have missing noses. I would say he has one of the most sabotaged noses <laughs> in ancient Kemetic history. It's amazing. None of them are there. Now, I know instantly people are going to say, oh, well, it's a result of iconoclasm and future pharaohs did it and this, that and the other. And I am not going to discount the possibility that could be true. But I do know, at least in a couple of occasions, I have first-hand primary research that this is not the case. And actually, some of this destruction, I believe, was done by Eurocentrists and done by Europeans and imperialists when they were confronted with the face of these Africans. Now, why do I say that? One of the reasons I say that is because when I went to the British Museum, I actually took these photos. So the photos you see on the screen at the moment are photos that I took. And the reason I took these photos and I made sure I took a close up is because I knew exactly why I was seeing. You'll see that there's three statues here, all of which have missing noses. But there's two statues that I believe the damage to be very recent. Now, why do I believe this? Let's have a look at this one in particular, where you can see the epicenter of the damage is cracking throughout the statue. And yet the epicenter of the damage is the nose. So you can see there's a circle around the cracking of the nose, signifying that this was probably the point of impact because it has that kind of impact pattern and everything seems to emanate from here. And what you'll notice is that the way these cracks are formed, this statue fell apart when this nose was struck. And what you're seeing is the result of it being essentially puzzled back together. Now, the reason I saw this as a bit of a smoking gun is because of the hairline nature of the way this is being puzzled back together. And it's not only true of this statue, on the other statue over here that I'm showing you, where you can actually see on this statue the cementing compound that has been used to glue it back together. So I'd say it's really out of possibility one and two. Did they do the damage or did they find it fragmented already. Well, the reason we can strike out the idea that they found it damaged already is because, like I said, we don't have the necessary missing pieces and corrosion that you would expect from something that had been damaged thousands of years ago. 
this is just all too whole, all too complete and all too devoid of any kind of missing pieces. So therefore, that leads me to believe that at least in the case of these two statues, I'm not saying all of um, Sinusret's statues, but I'm saying at least in the case of these two, I think we have very clear evidence of recent damage by the European art collectors, imperialists, early Egypt, whatever, whoever you want to blame for this. And before you say this is a massive conspiracy theory that you're throwing out there, you have to bear in mind, on my father's side, I descend from Benin. Now, when Benin was invaded by the British and they breached the Great Wall of Benin and they managed to get to the Palace of the Oba, you know all of those wonderful Benin bronzes you see hanging up in the British Museum? They've all been stolen from the Palace of the Oba. Now, why am I raising this? So we know the British still, big deal, okay? They've got everyone's stuff. Yeah, I know that. Why am I raising this? Well, a quote from the British said, that the palace of the Oba was made out of more raw material than the Great Pyramid of Giza. Do you know what remains of the palace of the Oba to this day? Zilch. They didn't leave one stone laying on top of the other. They literally blew it apart with dynamite and raised it to the ground. Now, why is this significant? If this palace had more material than the largest stone structure in the world, it was a massive, colossal building that was steeped in hundreds of years of history. And they felt no way to blow it apart with dynamite and literally raise it to the ground when they invaded Benin to the point where it's just a figment of the memories of the people of the Benin. So when people make claims like they wouldn't, smash a statue they wouldn't smash your nose off put it in the context of imperialism in that time and you'll realize that actually smashing a few noses of statues is right up the street of european imperialism let's talk about the artwork itself and you know me i'm very complimentary of ancient egyptian artwork and the brilliance of its accuracy and its consistency you know, one of the reasons they say that ancient Egyptian artwork or Kemetic artwork wasn't realistic, you know, they weren't being realistic. It was just vanity experiments by their pharaohs. It wasn't what they looked like, this, that, and the other. It's because essentially the statues looked too African, they, or at least they weren't European enough. So they couldn't pass them for Europeans and therefore they had to say, well, they're not realistic. But Pharaoh Sin Reset the Third, like all pharaohs before him, like Tutankhamun and like all the pharaohs that came after him, all of his statues are very consistent. And you can see that they are very accurate artworks depicting the same person. Here are some really intriguing traits that I absolutely became obsessed with when I was creating his reconstruction. He has these very drawn and gaunt cheeks that are instantly recognisable. He has these strong protruding eyes that are very piercing, even though most of the statues don't have any eyeballs. These, <laughs> these eyes are very piercing. It's almost like with these three statues at the British Museum, it's almost as though they're staring at you, they're peering at you. I don't know how they managed to achieve these. And also, <laughs> most notably, he has these humongous ears. Now, it's really funny because I posted kind of a work in progress of my reconstruction of Pharaoh in the third to my Patreon group. I didn't give any clues, I just literally posted the photo and said, which Pharaoh is this? And they all guessed it right. So how do you know? And I said, those ears are unmistakable. And it's true, he has these very, I mean, I, I always thought I had kind of like biggish ears growing up, but his ears absolutely, you know, take the biscuit, really large, expressive ears. So he's got these traits that when you look at his face, you just know that it's him. But here's something that's actually even more interesting. Sinistret III's face actually is a almost a spitting image of Pharaoh or Neswut Amenemhat III, who is his son. And it's really peculiar because Sinistret III and Amenemhat III actually had a 20 year overlap of leadership or rule, which is very peculiar. So it just raises the question mark about whether or not we're getting the complete picture. 
I'm not saying they're the same person. I'm not saying they couldn't be father or son. I'm just saying that as a reconstruction artist and someone who spends almost his entire day staring at faces, understanding, recognising traits, being able to link phenotype, being able to link phenotype geographically, being able to understand the physical diversity of human beings. So I kept getting these familial traits poking through. Now, the good news is, despite the obvious sabotage of several of Sinister III's statues and likenesses, there were a couple that were preserved, and it was almost by chance. So I managed to find this preserved obsidian statue showing Sinister III's entire face with his nose preserved. I believe this in a private collection, so I don't think this is even on display within a museum. So this is quite interesting. And there's also this other fragment that is believed to be Sinister at the Third. So we have these two fragments now. Out of all of these, looking at the obsidian face, that one seemed to really resonate with the rest of the artworks I've seen. I'm not saying the other ones, I mean, they all look the same essentially, and you'll see when the reconstruction hits that they, it is the same nose, but this one was really clear, so I could work with this. So you know essentially where, where I get to next. I've I've found the statues, I've got the artworks, I've got an idea of what his completed face looks like. I'm looking for continuity. I'm looking for phenotypic placement. <laughs> I'm looking to see where can I, where have I seen this face? Where do I see these features? Where do I see this completed picture? Where have I seen it before? And it was one of those things where I knew I had seen it and I wasn't sure where and I'm telling you now I looked for a long time and then it just literally hit me it literally hit me I said <laughs> just like I've said this before this happened last time when I was doing the reconstruction of Amos Nefertari and her nose I said that's I was like yeah that's a Burundi nose well ironically we're at a region that's very very close I would say neighboring to Burundi we're looking at Rwanda and I said this is Tutsi I've seen these features before. In fact, I've seen this face before and I began researching and looking through Tootsie photos and this hairstyle is called Amasunzu and I don't want to post a spoiler, but I've got another video coming soon that actually links Amasunzu or these hairstyles to the pharaonic hairstyles and the link is very, very strong. Thousands of years of peaceful cohabiting between Tootsie and Hutu people who, you know, were in Rwanda and actually bordering some of Burundi. They had their history destroyed by phrenology, which essentially meant they were openly given better treatment, better access to people who fitted certain boundaries of acceptable phenotype through measurements. I mean, I mean, this is years, this is like, you know, decades before Hitler tried this stuff. European imperialism and its footprint in Africa is significant and the damage it's done is in many cases irreversible. So the sadness about many of these images I'm showing you now is that these are lost to time. There is still Amasunzu trend and Amasunzu culture that you know is throughout Rwanda. One of the things that I think is actually really important for me to point out at this stage as well is as we have a look at these Watutsi or Tutsi people's head shapes is the widespread dolichocephaly. Now dolichocephaly is something I do speak about rather extensively on this channel because it is a uniquely African trait. Now I know some people have the impression that therefore the absence of dolichocephaly means that people aren't African so I'm going to spell this out. Africans have very vast phenotypic diversity. So it means we have all the head shapes from dolichocephalic, which is long head, which means essentially that our heads are longer than they are wide, right up to brachycephalic, which is where your head is essentially round or square shaped. If you look at these Tutsi people that I'm showing you, you can see it's almost universal. You see this in the Kalenjin, you can see this in the Maasai, but I've, you haven't seen it mentioned, but it's also in the Tutsi. You can see it in all of these images. 
and it's visible so I don't have to explain it no one has to get out a measuring rod you can just look at these people and you can see they have from the front very narrow heads and they're quite long that is a Kemetic trait and that is an African trait though there were some people in ancient Kemet that weren't dolichocephalic it was actually a, quite a minority so this is this is a, a really good example of ancient Kemetic headships you also know that the Tutsi people that I'm showing you here, although they have dolichocephaly, they don't have very pronounced subnasal prognathism. Now, what a lot of Eurocentrists and really ignorant people do is they say, well, the absence of subnasal prognathism therefore means that they are some kind of hybrid European race. No not all Africans, once again, we're talking about African phenotypic diversity. The absence of subnasal prognathism does not therefore mean they are not African because there are many Africans who do not have sub subnasal prognathism. And we don't need anything outside of Africa to explain it. You don't need hybridization to explain the lack of subnasal prognathism and you don't need some kind of alien race to explain the widespread dolichocephaly. In particular, this image I saw, and I compared it to the obsidian, and I said, this is an exact match. I mean, if I was going to take a human being and say, give me a human being that looks exactly, a living human that looks exactly like Sinistret the Third in his life, this would be that living human being. Um, it has a little, little bit of um, <laughs> Nipsey Hussle going on there, but I'm not going to go into that. But either which way, what was fantastic is, Amongst the Tutsi, and as you can see, amongst these, all of these wonderful images of kind of these Tutsi um, people, I had found the feather type that I believed matched the face of Sinisret the Third almost perfectly, and so that makes it easy for me to do my reconstruction. So here is my reconstruction of Sinisret the Third. You can see I've carried over the nose almost identically, um, as realistically as possible. Those very, very notable lips with that kind of like outside downturn, um, I, but they were actually quite easy to recreate. And because it's such a common, a common look in that region of Africa. And then we have those, those big protruding ears. Now I know in a lot of the other statues, his ears are larger and protrude forward more, but that's because of the the way he wears the Nemes headrest actually pushes his ears forwards in a lot of those statues. So if I had him in the Nemes, then I would have his ears pushed forward. But since I've just got him here without a crown, and I also have him here with the crown of upper, upper Kemet, I haven't had to push his ears forward. So I've got him in a more naturalistic state, as you can see, matches several of these other busts. But all in all, I think the face is very, very consistent. It looks like a Tootsie man. And I'm very, very happy for that because like I said, that was what I believed I was seeing. That is what resonated out to me when I saw the statues and that's what looked absolutely right. And it's quite ironic because I've found myself in and around this Rwanda, Urundi, Uganda region now for my last couple of reconstructions and one reconstruction ago was the first time I had visited it. So it's just quite interesting the way these kind of clusters form when I'm doing my work. But I'm all in all, I have to say, I'm, I'm really, really pleased with the reconstruction. I believe it captures the essence of what Sinisret the Third, or at least what he looked like. Um, and I really hope that it does him justice because when we look at reconstructions that have been done by the Eurocentrists and by the Arab centrists and when they create reconstructions they completely change or ignore the artwork that they're faced with because to them the artwork is not realistic because it's too African. I'm honouring the artwork and that's my approach to work and that will remain 
my approach to creating reconstructions of the great African civilization, which was Aisha Kemet. So here's also a bonus. I ran my reconstruction through a AI agent algorithm um, called FaceLab. It's actually a, an app that's freely available for anyone to use. But I got some really interesting results. Now these are unprocessed, fresh from the app. Um, so that it could do some extra work. But I want to show you first of all, the younger reconstruction, because I saw some really interesting trends that came up when I pulled up the younger reconstruction. So when I pull it up here, first of all, there are some kind of facial features to notice that perhaps had gone over my head. So the first thing that jumped out at me is the lower portion of his mouth, the way it sticks out like that. I didn't even notice when I had created my reconstruction how much I had adhered to that in the original. So it wasn't a feature that I necessarily noticed. If you ask me what features did you kind of like really focus on, I'll tell you all the lips, making sure I captured that shape, making sure I got the, the nose was obviously a big one, you know, matching nose on the obsidian statue and the very large ears and obviously the eyes making them protrude. But if you had asked me and the lower part of the mouth making that kind of like push out slightly wasn't really even under my radar but it's something clearly that is there you can see it there and it's an important part of why it looks like Sinusret's statues or Sinusret the third statues I should say now this is really accentuated when the AI algorithm you know makes it look younger you can kind of see that feature and what's really um, striking to me about this is when you compare the look of this younger version of Sinusret to A, his younger statues, but actually more tellingly, and this was quite interesting, if you pull up Aminemhat III, who's Sinusret III's son, um, it's almost a spitting image. I mean, you can see them here side by side. That is almost literally the same person. I think the only thing that I would need to probably enhance slightly to make this a perfect match literally a perfect match would be to slightly widen the face and slightly olgen <laughs> for want of a better word embolgen i don't know but to slightly make the eyes a little bit larger i think those would be the only kind of two things that i would need to do and i would have like this this is a that's the same person so as you can imagine that's very gratifying to me because not only have I done a reconstruction that I've said to myself, like, I'm going to try and be as true as possible to the comedic artwork. I've run it through an agent algorithm and what it's kind of spat out at the other end is perfectly in line and in situ with the statues of not only a younger Sinister III, but also the statues of his son, which is, you know, that kind of blows out of the water, this whole idea that all of the comedic artworks were just, you know, guesswork and you know random statues of beautiful people to you know appease the to appease the vanity of the rulers the kings and queens of Kemet that's I mean that's a load of rubbish you have to sift out the Eurocentric lies they will create a lie just like they did with the noses and the iconoclasm you know they've done it with the statues to point people away from the fact that hey I know these look really really African but don't worry about that. Those thick lips and stuff. This was just a comedic art style. It wasn't. These are real people. These are real people. These are real features. And this is what they look like in life. Or at least this is my best approximation. I can't say with any, you know, telling authority that it looked exactly like this. But I can certainly say that I'm giving it a better try than most, um, yeah, reconstruction artists do. So there you go. So that's the younger one. Have a look at the older one as well, because this is this is this is older now. Obviously, this is a, um, a fate, you know, an aging algorithm that's not tailored to the melanated man. So the reason I say that is because you know, by and large, we don't wrinkle that much. So this is their kind of old filter. But this is for a melanated person. This would be ancient. Someone have to be kind of hundred years old to have this many wrinkles. We just you know our faces don't wrinkle that much. So this one probably needs a slight reduction in the number of wrinkles showing a little bit of retouching if you want to show like a 70 slash 80 year old man you'd have to reduce it slightly because um you know melanated people don't degrade this much but i still think 
what was very interesting is the eyes have further, you know, bulged, you know, I'm using that word again, but they look more kind of like bulgy. And if you look at the statues of an older Sinister the Third, his eyes do look bulgier. So it's caught that really well. It's caught the kind of the drawnness and the, the gauntness of the, and the cheekbones are really kind of like sticking out at you. The only thing I think that's missed slightly is the face looks slightly wider. And in Sinister the Third's case on his older statues, the face actually looks slightly narrower. But well, that would be easily fixed. But I just thought that was really interesting how you could take the original reconstruction and once again, it just kind of qualifies the work that's being done here because we take the original reconstruction, we chuck it into an algorithm and the algorithm chucks back at us more artworks of either Sinisfoot III himself or people within his family. So as you can imagine, yes, I find that very, very gratifying. Thank you for joining me on the King's Monologue. It's my honor to serve you with this work. Um, it's great to get back in front of the camera in front of you guys again. If you can support me on Patreon, I would very much appreciate it. Um, having Patreon supporters does allow me to produce more work and to do more documentaries and dedicate more time to this as you can imagine this isn't my full-time job but i would love it to be one day so please do consider supporting me on patreon or buying some merchandise i know many of you buy the merchandise just to support me and you come back and you say how much you love the t-shirt i'm wearing one now please do that if you're able to other than that like share subscribe but more than anything make sure you join me for the next one and i'll see you then Thank you.